Many eyewitnesses were reporting a mid-air explosion and terror alerts were immediately triggered. There was absolutely no chance of recovery of this. Incidents podcast. We are an aviation podcast focusing on historical aviation incidents, their co causes, and their stories. My name is Sebastian, and I am hosting the German speaking Air Crash podcast as well. This show is a spin off of our successful German version. So I hope everybody is fine. Um, it's two weeks since our uh, last episode, which was a uh, pretty well performing i have to say thank you very much for listening to all of you um we really like that um also thank you for the facebook comments and everything we received we're living with and from your feedback this is definitely the most important thing to us so whenever you have anything in mind please send us feedback i'm not doing this show alone i have a lovely wonderful co-host which I am going to introduce to you right now. She is a professional podcaster, a blogger, and the counterpart to my technical nerdiness. <laughs> From Stuttgart, in beautiful southern Germany, our first officer, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. How are you doing today? Hello, Sebastian. <laughs> I'm doing very well. It's a Sunday, so it's a very easy going day, and I... I just went for a run before we started to record the episode and yeah, now I'm ready for that. And how are you? Oh, well, I'm, I'm pretty great as well. And I'm, I'm pretty relieved because now I know that your running is the reason that you were two hours late and <laughs> you was too serious two or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I wasn't two hours late. I was one hour late and I told yeah, you. Yeah, it was before. one and a half though. <laughs> no, you're lying. It was exactly one hour. I mean, the the... The time after that was just because of technical problems. <laughs> All right, folks. So um, what we know from now on is that between 12 and 1.30 is one hour. Please keep that in mind if you want to talk oh to Sarah God, sometime. Oh, my God, stop it's it. It's going to be important. <laughs> 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 All right, now, um, well, this is always funny to talk to you about nonsense. <laughs> um, our our topic today is, is, is not so funny, actually. It's, it's, it's more of a serious thing. Um, yeah, let's get right into it, Sarah. Yeah, today's topic is an accident that gathered huge attention due to the time and place when and where it happened. Yeah, that's right. American 587 departing JFK International with service to Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic crashed in Queens on November 12, 2001. Well, this was two months after the September 11 attacks. People faced another potential terroristic attack on, on U.S. soil. It turned out that the cause of the accident was not an attack, but let's start from the beginning. Sarah's now going to tell us what happened. November 12th, 2001. Two months had went by since the terrible September 11th attacks on the United States of America. New York City is still in shock, desperately trying to heal its deep wounds from that dreadful day. John F. Kennedy International, however, went back to normal. Security measures had been massively increased and nobody believes that terrorists would be able to hijack a plane ever again on US soil. A feeling of security that should be in question for months after this November morning. American 587 is scheduled for service to Santa Domingo this morning. The plane executing the flight is an Airbus A300, one of the oldest planes of American's fleet. At 10 past 9 in the morning, the plane is taxiing to runway 31 left. They are number two in line after a Boeing 747 operated by Japan Airlines. 
One minute and 40 seconds after the Japanese jumbo, American 587 takes to the skies and immediately follows its course towards Queens. The flight is meant to pass Bell Harbor, a quiet and peaceful suburb in Queens, which houses many police and fire workers who are still in shock after September 11th, as many of them became heroes that day. Just minutes after takeoff of American 587, JFK Tower is made aware of a plane that went down south of the airfield. American 587 crashed into Bell Harbor, destroying multiple buildings and damaging others. 265 people die, five of them were on the ground in their homes. Just 62 days after September 11th, New York is still in shock once more. Tourist attractions being evacuated, UN headquarters goes on lockdown. Hundreds of witnesses state that they saw a mid-air explosion. Was it another attack on America? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. This was a truly terrible accident. 255 lives on board and five more on the ground were lost that day. It was a Monday after Veterans Day. Many people were at home and, and just two months later, obviously the grief on the September 11th attacks is was very present everywhere. The affected residential area of Queens houses many police officers and firefighters. Um, the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, was under enormous pressure. Eyewitnesses and other factors were indicating a mid-air explosion. Way too early media reports on this, um, as well as speculation everywhere, were affecting the board's work. New York and Washington alike, the accident became number one priority and the political pressure was just as high as the media's pressure. So let's just start and have a closer look at the initial situation. American 587 was executed by an Airbus A300-600. It was delivered to American as a new plane 13 years prior and therefore was one of the oldest planes of the airline's fleet. However, the Airbus was in great technical condition. The crew was highly experienced and they were longtime American employees. The plane took off at JFK from runway 31 left using a very normal procedure. One minute and 40 seconds prior to the Airbus A300, a JAL, which is, Jamer which is Japan Airlines, 747 took off from the same runway. At about 450 feet, American 587 made a left turn towards heading 220. Just under three minutes after leaving JFK, the plane crashed into a residential area in Bell Harbor, Queens. Both engines were separated from the plane in the descent and impacted north and south of the main crash site. The impact of the aircraft destroyed four houses completely, damaging some others in the process. JFK Tower was informed about the crash by another aircraft. The column of smoke, however, was visible from the tower. Yes, and responding rescue units faced an apocalyptic scene. Huge flames, smoke and debris. Many must have remembered what they had experienced two months prior on September 11th. Many eyewitnesses were reporting a mid-air explosion and terror alerts were immediately triggered. Empire State Building was evacuated, UN headquarters went on lockdown, and F-15 fighter jets were scrambled. Yeah. The investigation of this accident was very challenging from the beginning. Media attention was enormous and the given scenery itself was, well, kind of cryptic, if you will. Just hours after the impact, the cockpit voice recorder was found. Uh, around the same time, the vertical stabilizer was found about a mile north of the site in Jamaica Bay. There were quite some clues for a bomb, but just as many spoke against such a theory. It must have been a huge challenge for the investigators. Witness reports and big parts disintegrating from the airframe in mid-air were indications for a bomb really clear indications for a bomb. On the other hand side though, the position of those parts on the airframe clearly spoke against such a thing. Also, there were no indications for explosives of any kind at the accident site. 
Yes, and the one thing they had was the CVR, which was in good condition and therefore could be analyzed quite quickly. But it did not really bring the investigation forward, because the recordings did show that the crew was somehow fighting with controlling the plane. However, a bang was recorded as well that immediately set the focus back on attack. In total, the NTSB interrogated 349 witnesses. About half of them were saying they either heard or saw an explosion. Additionally, the flight data recorder was found, but it was unfortunately massively damaged. And yeah, that's why it was not easy to analyze it. Well, that's true. Let's talk about air crash investigation in general for a second here. Um, this is not only a highly complex and technical field, it is also one that forbids speculations by nature. An NTSB agent must never have an idea of what could have happened, but always needs to look at the whole picture. Those guys do not search for proof of a specific theory, but collect data and then come to a conclusion of what has happened. This is tremendously important in a case like this one, because only then you see the bigger picture and initially unimportant details become relevant. One detail they looked into here was the takeoff queue at JFK. As said, about 1 minute and 40 seconds before Amer American 587, a Boeing 747 departed from the same runway. Now, I have to get a bit into aerodynamics here. I'm absolutely sure many of you aviation enthusiasts listening to us already know what I'm going to talk about now. But not all of our listeners are experts. The thing we need to have a closer look on is wake vertexes. Those are an aer aerodynamic phenomenon that occurs on the tips of every airplane's wing. Planes fly due to lift created by the wings. This lift is achieved by laminar flow of air over the wing, which flows faster than the surrounding air and therefore creates a vacuum, kind of sucking up the plane, if you will. At the end of the wings, this laminar flow meets surrounding air, creating a ring vortex behind the wing, the so-called vague vortex. The intensity of the air turbulence caused by this strongly depends on the aircraft size. Those turbulences are known as wake turbulence. Well, who would have guessed that? <laughs> and yeah, they can become quite violent. I have a quick example here. Back in 2017, a Challenger 604 business jet accidentally flew into the work tur turbulence caused by an Airbus A380 in cruise altitude. The effect on the much smaller business jet was so intense that it rolled three times, went into a rapid 9,000 feet descent and injured some of the p uh, passengers in the process. The plane was able to emergency land, but the damage was so excessive that the Challenger had to be written off. This incident occurred with both planes at cruise altitude. The effect of wake vortexes is even more intensive in climb or descent. However, those effects are also really well known. The traffic uh, at airports is separated far enough for avoiding them, and the intensity of them is very well researched. In fact, they even directly affect radio communications. When you ever heard um, ATC radio before, you may have realized that some planes are called heavy or super, like after their call sign. Um, all white body aircraft are called heavy. White body aircraft are the ones that have two aisles. Um, the Airbus A380 and the Antonov N225 cargo plane are called super as their own category. The reason for all that is, in fact, the intensity of their wake vortexes. An A300 being a heavy itself can start behind the 747. Remember, there was a Japan Airlines 747 taking off before American 587. If separated correctly, this may cause some minor turbulence, but yeah, that's about it. Nothing to worry about too much. Obviously, wake turbulences are affected by the weather, though. So wake turbulences were considered possible, but not like the first thing to look into. But this particular aircraft did have a history that made the topic quite interesting to look into, right? Yeah, well, kind of. Kind of, yes, I, I say. Um, 
The plane has in the past been intensively checked after a heavy turbulence incident back in 1994, but at the time no issues with the airframe were discovered. Another thing is that this aircraft had to undergo maintenance whilst still in production as there was an issue with the delamination of composite materials on the vertical stabilizer. Those issues have been fixed back in the day and before the plane was actually delivered. Now this still is interesting though, as we know the vertical stabilizer did separate before the actual impact. Both undiscovered structural issues and delaminations are highly unlikely but could be a reason for this separation. The investigators did know that the stabilizer was mounted using six bolts which were held in place using one aluminum lug and one compound lug each. It was quite quickly discovered that on all six bolts the compound lugs were the ones that broke off. Due to this there was some concern that the lamination was a factor here. This would have been an enormous issue for Airbus and an issue like this would have affected most of Airbus's fleet at the time and would potentially have put hundreds of thousands of passengers in danger. That scenario did not happen. Right, and as in the meantime, the investigators were able to partially evaluate information from the flight data recorder. Terra immediately was off the table, but the wake vortexes did in fact play a huge role as far as I understood this. The plane did enter the wake vortexes from the previous... GAL departure, but that didn't immediately cause the crash, right? No, it did not. We now know that wake turbulence did indeed affect the plane. Pilot flying for takeoff was the first officer in the right seat. Before talking on what he did, let's take a closer look at the construction of passenger planes in general um, and the A300 in particular. So let's talk a vertical stabilizer for a second. It is responsible for lateral control of the airplane. It is like a wing that does not create lift but stabilizes the aircraft around its vertical axis, pretty much like a fin under a boat. At the rear end of the stabilizer is the rudder that can be moved left or right and is controlled by the paddles in the, in the cockpit. When it is moved to one side, it kind of transforms the stabilizer into a vertical wing that works just like the actual wings on the plane. So it produces lift towards the other side and therefore points the rear of the plane towards this direction, which eventually leads to the nose of the plane pointing towards the opposite direction. This is needed for supporting turns at lower speeds and also for lateral correction of the plane, like wind compensation and stuff like that. We also need to talk uh, about the Airbus A300 in particular a little bit before we get to what actually happened. The A300 was the first plane that Airbus ever produced. It and its predecessor, the A310, were the only planes developed uh, by the company that came with a traditional cockpit layout with a yoke and not side sticks. The flight controls were physically connected to the control su surfaces, was today the controls use digital information to accurate the surfaces. The physical connection in the A300 is supported by hydraulic, which means that maximum travel on a paddle means maximum deflection of the rudder as well. In addition, the plane's characteristics already reflected Airbus's modern system philosophy. Usually, uh, the force needed to actuate aircraft controls is progressive and mimics the force needed in a classic non-hydraulic supported plane. That means higher speeds mean more force needed to actuate as more airflow is on the control surface. The force needed in an A300 is linear. It always stays the same, no matter of the speed of the aircraft. So the maximum deflection of the rudder is indeed key to this accident, or? Right, absolutely, yes. Let's, um, for, for explaining that, let's just go back to what actually happened. This is all well documented by the flight data recorder, um, so, yeah, the plane did encounter the wake turbulence of the 747 that was flying ahead of him. Uh, the pilot reacts to the turbulence with about half deflection of the rudder to the right, and the plane points the nose towards the right. The input was a little too much, so he wanted to correct it back to the left, this time using a three-quarter deflection. 
which results in the plane now violently throwing the nose from left to right, uh, from right to left. The captain applies maximum throttle as the airspeed is affected by this and is decreasing quickly. After those first two deflections, uh, three, more, three more followed. The last one being maximum, and additionally the yoke is also moved to maximum right as well. The resulting forces on the rear end of the plane, yeah, they simply were too much. The vertical stabilizer was not able to handle the load anymore and broke off. Without stabilizer, the plane immediately became uncontrollable, entered a flat spin, and the forces on the airframe then became so high that both engines separated. There was absolutely no chance of recovery of this. So what you're saying, if I get this right, um, you're saying that the maximum deflection of the rudder destroyed the airplane. But how is that even possible? How can it be that pushing the pedal to the maximum simply destroys an aircraft? I know what you, what you mean, and, and it does sound a bit strange that something like this is even possible. But the reason is quite simple. Those huge deflections are dangerous at higher speeds, but the slower an airplane gets, the more rudder deflection is needed to keep control. Um, just think of a car here. Everybody knows that turn, turning the steering wheel excessively at high speed will result in a situation you really don't want to be in. But at lower speeds, well, that's a different story. Anyways, in more modern aircraft, especially in Airbus models with the fly-by-wire system, this cannot happen anymore as the computer decides what the needed deflection for the desired action is. Okay, I get it. So if we come back to the comparison with a car. So when I'm driving, I know I can't tear the steering wheel around at high speeds. And so should pilots know that as well? So I don't really understand why he would do that then. Well, Sarah, that's an interesting one. Now, I have to say there are two reasons for this, a physical one and a training issue. As we're really into aerodynamics and control of airplanes right now, I'll start with the physical one. As just said, the pilot corrected every input with a counter input, if you will. But those counter inputs became more excessive every time they were applied. This is a very well-known phenomenon called pilot indu inducted oscillations. Those occur due to the way an aircraft reacts to control inputs. This is applicable to all aircraft, not only the big ones. Between input and execution always is a short delay. Let me explain that real quick. Every control input is connected and triggers several things. Climbing reduces airspeed, so more thrust is needed. More thrust generally uh, creates a nose-up moment, so less elevator is needed, and so on and so on. Now, if you want to make a left turn with a 15-degree bank angle, you turn the yoke left until you reach those 15 degrees. I get back to a car here for the comparison. In a car, you simply hold the wheel until your turn is completed. Um, in a plane, that is not true, as the bank angle will increase more and more as long as you hold the yoke in a non-neutral position. So once you enter the turn, you need to go back to neutral and then counter-steer eventually to complete your turn. Now keep in mind, all this happens with a slight delay. So it is important to react um, a little bit in advance. If you, for example, go back to neutral just when your indicator says 15 degrees bank angle, to stay within our example here, um, the plane will roll a little more and then you have to counter that. Now with banking, that's not too much of an issue as long as you're not in an aerobatic plane or something that, that really re reacts extremely quickly to banking. Um, but yawing and pitching, this can become a problem really quickly. And in fact, this accident was due to pilot-inducted yawing oscillations. PIOs are known by all pilots. There is training to avoid them, and so they should not happen with highly trained professionals. But in this very specific situation, it was discovered that the training by American Airlines was yeah, simply containing a false procedure. 
every airplane has I'm, I'm sorry i have to I, i have to stay technical here just just for the better understanding <laughs> of what happened I'm, i'm really sorry i know i'm nerding out right now but it's gonna be a little over. bit <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry sarah it's 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 gonna be over real quickly i was I about to ask something but i will yeah just finish <laughs> yeah, write down your questions and ask them when it's your turn <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> all right all right um back back on topic Every airplane has a defined maneuver speed. This is the highest allowed speed for full rudder deflections. At this speed, however, a single rudder may be deflected to maximum once, not several times and not multiple rudders at a time. American Airlines trained their pilots to react to wake turbulence with immediate and full rudder deflection. This is not wrong by all means, but it was clearly discovered that American did not teach to do this only once. Surveys revealed that many American Airlines pilots at the time were convinced that multiple maximum deflection at or below maneuvering speed were applicable if needed. Interestingly, Airbus saw that flaw in the American Airlines training before this accident happened and requested changes in the procedure as several incidents with overloaded vertical stabilizers had occurred before. But, okay, to come back to my question now, so you said that, yeah, the reason was the training by American Airlines. So would you say that the pilot did was what he was trained for? Because that would mean that American Airlines training was responsible for that accident, right? And And then also, if they were trained for that, why hasn't that happened then more often? Well, um, that's two completely separate questions, Sarah. <laughs> well, um, one after the other. <laughs> it, okay, let, let, let's talk about why this did not happen uh, more often. We do know that there were incidents um, with the vertical stabilizer on American Airlines Airbus planes. This definitely did happen. None of them separated. And in general, those, those things are really, really, really tough. Now for something like that to happen there is a huge combination of things that have to come together to 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 actually lead to that outcome here we had an extremely heavy plane taken off right before um the the, the airplane affected by the crash the separation was at the minimum with one minute and 40 seconds so The weather was in a way that the wake turbulence of the 747 was quite high. This is a situation that doesn't occur too often. So probably that also is the main reason why this did not happen too often. When I did my research on this episode, um, I have to be honest, I didn't know that before that there was such a big issue with that topic with American Airlines pilots. But my understanding is that due to the flaw in their training this could have pretty much happened every minute so oh well yeah um but as said it it needed that exact situation that's going on now for your second question sarah whether this is a um just a, a sole training issue as as the pilots uh, did what he was supposed to do mm. i'd say it's a combination here The training meant to train only one maximum deflection, but this was executed purely. Many pilots misunderstood that part of the tra training. But by all means and misunderstanding, the excessive use of the rudder that was applied here was way too much by all means. Um, the NTSB states that the cause of the accident is separation of the vertical stabilizer, eventually resulting in loss of control of the aircraft. They say the separation was caused by unnecessary and avoidable excessive rudder input. As contributing factors, they list the A300's maneuvering characteristics and deficits in American Airlines training. Okay, so the board blames the pilot as mainly responsible, but also sees some guilt with Airbus and American Airlines. I assume the training was changed in Airbus overall their steering logic? All right, firstly, um, I want to say that the NTSB is not a law enforcement agency by any means. Their sole purpose is to investigate and identify reasons for accidents to prevent chances of similar occurrences in future. So uh, they don't really blame someone, if you will. 
American did change the training and specified it. Airbus, however, did not change the linear logic in the steering system as it is part of its system philosophy. So would you say that this could happen any time again? I mean, the danger is still present, isn't it? I, I don't really think so. A300s are practically not present in passenger aviation anymore. So even if they were, the system philosophy was only contributing as the training was not sophisticated enough. Yeah, and mentioning that, let's talk about Airbus philosophy real quick. Next episode, we will have um, a chance to talk about this topic a little more and a little more in detail as we have a guest who is not only an aviation podcaster himself, but also a former Airbus A330 and A340 captain. Exactly. Captain Nick, co-host of Airline Pilot Guy, is joining us next episode as we will talk about an accident that was not caused but influenced by Airbus's control philosophy. In June 2009, Air France Flight 447 from Rio de Janeiro to Paris crashed in the Atlantic Ocean, killing all 228 souls on board. It took almost two years to find the plane, and the cause of this crash is truly unbelievable. With Nick being a former captain on the same type used in the crash, we will get a very detailed and interesting look into the topic. We absolutely will, and I'm totally looking forward to this. So um, <laughs> if you like this episode or if you have any questions or something um, to us, your feedback is what drives us to do this, that. So feel free to send us an email anytime. Uh, you can also contact us in social media. Um, I'll just list you all the contact methods right now. Our email address is feedback at aircrashpodcast.de. This is DE Delta Echo. Um, as we're using one email address for both podcasts we produce. Um, you also find us in social media on Instagram and Facebook. Our, hand, our handle is at Air Incidents Podcast. Also, um, if you like what we're doing and you want to support us a little bit, we are on Patreon, where you find several packages uh, with several benefits. Our Patreon site is um, www.patreon.com slash aircrashpodcast. Our Patreon is for both podcasts, um, but everything there is explained in German and English as well, so if you want to look into that. If you maybe want to do... Uh, one-time donation, buy us a coffee, or do something like that. We also established a PayPal me link, which is www.paypal.me slash aircrashpodcast. So if you want to look into there, we'd be really happy as well. So, yeah, um, we don't have any feedback yet. We are still collecting some to, to start feedback, most likely in the next episode. Our next episode will air on April th Friday, April 30th, 2021. As just said, it's going to be about Air Frost 447. Um, really interesting one for me. I did the German version of this crash alone. It was the very first uh, air crash podcast episode of all times. And now I'm doing the English version with my lovely co-host and an expert on the, on the topic who is one of the persons who actually influenced me to make an aviation podcast. So <laughs> this really is a huge thing for me. Um, I'm also very excited <laughs> to do that. That's what she said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really am. I really am. I know. We, are, we, we, we both are. We worked with Nick together uh, for the German uh, version before, which was a great experience. I also did a live show uh, with him where I kind of talked German and, and then translated back and forth. So it's, it's really going to be relieving to work with him just in an, an overall English version. All right, you guys. All right. We talk to each other in two weeks. Send us your feedback. This is tremendously important to us, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you guys. Um, until two weeks. My name is Sebastian. I am the host of this show. Joining me on the microphone, our beautiful and lovely co-host, Sarah. Have a great <laughs> time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Runway 18, clear to land, Delta Papa Charlie.